Hello everybody and welcome to this Tortoise Thinking with BP. Um, my name is Polly Curtis um, and I am an editor and partner at Tortoise Media. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a Thinking before, um, I'll explain a bit about how it works. A Thinking is a place for conversation, for debate, and um, we like to talk about civilized disagreement. So over the course of the next hour, we are trying to get to a better understanding of the question we've come together to discuss today. And that question is about life chances post COVID-19. How can we unleash everyone's potential? Um, so um, for this conversation, we have some absolutely fantastic speakers, including Brian Gilvari from BP, Justin Greening, the former MP and Secretary of State, and some of our brilliant partners of the Tortoise Network, who help to bring different voices into these conversations and diversify the conversation we're having. Um, and um, so we want all of you to join in the conversation as much as possible. We'll hear from our speakers and then I'll start to bring as many of you in as possible. We've got over a hundred people on the call. So, um, so I'm really keen to bring you all into the conversation. The way you do that, there are two ways you can flag that you want to join in. One is you can raise your digital hand. And to do that, you press on the participants button and you see a little gray button pop up that says raise hand. And if you do that, I'll see a little blue hand pop up and I'll be able to bring you into the conversation as soon as possible. And then the second way is you can leave your thoughts and comments and contributions in the chat where my colleague, Merope Mills is moderating. She's waving at you all now. And um, um, Merope can bring you into the chat at, at, at any point, help, help curate that conversation and flag to me that you want to um, uh, be involved. So thank you very much. We hope to hear from as many of you as possible. Um, but this subject, I just wanted to say, is something that's very close to our hearts at Tortoise. Um, in the first week of lockdown, um, we held a thinking looking at the poverty penalty of C-19, trying to understand how this would uh, play out in a country that is affected really by some big inequalities generally. Um, and I know that social mobility is um, very a passion of um, BPs and um, our partnership there. So we wanted to bring everyone together to have, have this conversation today. Um, and I thought I'd start with that quote that has really gained traction and which we first um, talked about um, at Tortoise all those weeks ago, which is the idea that this illness will not be the great leveller. All the inequalities we see across society risk being perpetuated in a crisis like this. Um, and th that's, that's the kind of starting point. We have heard that through a lot of the evidence about who's losing their jobs, a lot of evidence about who's actually affected by the illness. Um, but there is a pattern in this country about social mobility, and that's the thing we really want to focus on today. Um, so I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Takumbo Ajasa Aluo, who is uh, CEO of Career Ready, um, which is a social mobility organization that helps people make that leap into work. Um, and Takumbo, I thought you could really um, say from your first-hand experience of working with young people on, on that cusp of getting into work, what, what are you seeing the effects of this crisis being on those people? Uh, thanks, Polly. Um, we're seeing a number of factors that are relating to our young people that we work with. So just to provide some context, Career Ready works right across the UK. We work with thousands of young people um, that reflect a social mobility background. And our aspirations is to provide them with insights, experience, opportunities for them to make informed choices about their career aspirations. Um, and one of the key things that we've seen is, is a shrinkage of opportunities to do that on the ground. We work with a plethora of employers, large and small, across the UK. Um, and one of the significant changes that we've had to make this year 
this summer we were expecting to host or coordinate about a thousand paid internships for young people that wouldn't in normal circumstances have such opportunities to work in the businesses that we provide. Um, based on COVID, those opportunities have now had to be postponed or, um, and or cancelled. Um, and that's a big blow. That's a big blow for young people that um, we've worked with because internships, paid internships, we know have a big impact on young people's careers. Our charity has been going for 18 years. Um, and recently we just conducted some research on the legacy impact of our offer to young people. And there's three key ingredients that have helped young people um, from social mobility backgrounds achieve their, their aspirations. That's been connected with a mentor from the professional world mm. that treats them as an individual, treats them with dignity and supports them with that emotional as well as professional advice. It's about accessing paid experience within the workplace where they can get to understand the nuances of the different cultures that they're working within. And it's the presence of their increase in their social capital. And that idea of being able to grow their network, um, engage with uh, and, and interact with professionals that they would not normally have the opportunity to. So all three of those components have significantly been compromised by the COVID pandemic. I mean, we're acting in a nimble and proactive manner and doing as much as we can to engage with young people using mediums such as this, um, digital opportunities to engage with young people. But unfortunately, as you know, we're not dealing with a level playing field. So not every young person that we work with has access to a tablet, a smartphone, or even a laptop. And even when they do have that access, they may not have the requirements when it comes to Wi-Fi um, and the accessibility to even take part in some of our um, new offers that we've been provided for young people during this period. So it is bleak times um, in, in that respect, but there are opportunities for us to learn as a society. I mean, we went through a recession just over a decade ago, and I think it, it gave us uh, a template not to follow because uh, during that recession, one of the first things to go were initiatives such as um, uh, uh, Career Ready's offer to young people, which is about tackling social mobility, youth unemployment, those types of initiatives that have been the first ones to face uh, a red line through them. And when you reduce those kind of engagements, you see the legacy of that 10 years on. So we're still recovering when it comes to that generation of young people that either left school or graduated in 08, 09, um, it still had an impact on their career to this point. So this is an opportunity for businesses, organizations, employers, and society at large to think differently, be brave, and explore how we can actually enhance this undiscovered talent rather than um, repeating history. That's a, that's a really stark warning. And um, I mean, it's interesting on um, uh, mentoring, um, networking, uh, even paid work experience, those things aren't impossible in this environment. We're all finding ways to connect and do these, do our, do our jobs in, in different ways. Um, but um, I, I imagine it's a, a matter of headspace on the part of employers, just being kind of smart enough to to build in rather than seeing this as, as an add-on that you can let go at these times? Yeah, I think, I think that's a key point. So for us, we, we position our offer as a direct um, business value add. So yes, um, a lot of the times we engage with our partners through corporate social responsibility arms mm -hmm. or their philanthropic arm. But at the same time, our return on the investment, the return that businesses see, have a core f uh, impact on, on, on their business proposition. So the number of, we have approximately 4,000 uh, mentors, volunteers on our books that, that work with our young people um, on a regular basis. Um, and the return on investment is the impact on those individuals. They have uh, a new perspective of the employer they're working for. They have uh, a sense of energy and, uh, and vibrancy that goes back into their productivity um, within their day jobs. So there is real added value um, of taking on this type of opportunity. Um, and then when you measure it over a significant period of time, 
the data is there to show that the positive impact. And for you, what, what are you hearing from the, um, from the young people you're working with? Are they aware of these additional kind of barriers? You know, what, uh, what, what's the kind of mood amongst young people trying to make these changes at the moment? Um, from the young people that we've interacted with uh, through Career Ready um, and as some affiliated charities that, that work in a similar vein to us, is we work with a community of young people that are resilient. Um, although uh, a challenge is around the mental well-being and, and self-care, this is a, a new, a brand new experience for this generation. So um, a lot of support has been required in that emotional side of navigating the, the world, the new world as we'll see it. Some of these young people have worked very hard for their GCSEs and A-levels. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a stark reality that something so critical to their futures um, has been taken away. So it's uh, a lot of the time we've been observing the notion of emotional support around young people and providing them with enough information to make informed decisions about what they do next. Mm. So, thank you so much for that. That was really a fascinating insight. And um, just to say at any point, anyone can raise their digital blue hand by clicking on raise hand to contribute their experiences. I know we have a few young people who are part of the Tortoise Network um, who have funded places to be part of our membership um, on the call. And I'd love to hear from some of them as we kind of get into the conversation. Um, but thank you to Kimbo. And I, and I wonder whether we can, can come to Ella Saw next. Ella Saw is um, an apprentice leader at um, White Hat, which is an apprenticeship organization. Hi, Ella, how are you? Hi, good. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. And I don't know whether you want to give some reflections on what Takumbo was just talking about. What, what, what's your, been your experience through this crisis of thinking about how you and the people you work with can, can kind of get their, get on the next rung of the career ladder through this, this climate and this context? I think it's hard. I think a lot of people are feeling very sort of vulnerable and at risk um, in times like this. It feels like, I mean, from the sort of generalised perspective and the people I know, it's very sort of disheartening to think that you've come so far from sort of where you've come and so much already exceeding like expectations, whether it be through GCSE grades or just getting into a good school um, or actually making that contact um, with a mentor at a company. I think it's really important that when we move away from this, that we sort of say to them, like, now is not the time to give up. Um, that there are still going to be opportunities. And if there aren't opportunities, then we will find a way to support you. I think having that support, like you said, is really crucial um, for development. I know that I went through quite a lot of people telling me, like, um, sort of things like you won't get too far or, you know, as long as you just stay on the rails, like, that's all we expect of you and I think it's really important that we actually say despite this crisis you are still capable of getting to those aspirations this mm -hmm. might have been a delay or this overcoming this issue in itself is an opportunity to really display that resilience that they've already shown um Hello, I'd love to know what, what what's your position at the moment are you still working or how are you managing it yourself and, and explain a bit about your job uh, so I Currently, I'm still working, quite fortunately, um, at a media agency. So I'm lucky in the sense that our industry hasn't been too impacted. Um, but there is definitely a threat to our job security. We've had to see a couple of our apprentices at the moment have been made redundant. Um, and I feel like there is a sort of overlooming threat that we feel if they are going to make people redundant, we're sort of the first to go. Mm. Um, so it's definitely a scary thought. I think everyone on my team, both at White Hat and in the company, are just trying to sort of keep going um, and make it really crucial. But it does sort of almost impact your thinking about what you're going to do after the apprenticeship mm -hmm. um, in terms of further job prospects, because there will be so many people applying for jobs. The almost the competition feels much larger now. Mm -hmm. 
That's really concerning. Have you seen that T-shirt that says, I'm sick of being resilient? <laughs> I quite like that T-shirt. Um, and I really do understand, you know, it's, 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 it's to have work to get as far as you get and then have this mm -hmm. huge roadblock. Um, I can see Louise Jarvis in the comments is saying that, that actually we need to think about young people as bringing solutions as well as the ones that need help. Do you relate to that, Ella? Yeah, absolutely. I think I spent a lot of time, so in my previous school, I spent a lot of time sort of trying to help students almost just overcome the initial mental barrier that their fate is already decided. Um, and I think that's really important that we get that, I guess, that we push, I guess, for younger people to have that conversation. I think breaking through that barrier of approaching a sort of a young person to a young person and saying, look, I won't talk down to you, I know exactly what it's like you know you can come out of this I've done it like let's push you further and then I think it'd be really nice to see a lot of mentorships I guess from sort of younger people and executives in businesses because I think it's so I mean for me it was so much easier I guess to feel like my goals were realistic when I could see someone not that much older than me or not that much different to me able to sort of get there mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. Um, does. Thank you, Ella. Um, I can see in the chat there's an interesting question from Steve Thomas who says, I wonder to what extent young people in education or early career um, will be permanently dis disadvantaged by this stage or whether there'll be allowances made and they'll be able to get ahead. I, I just wanted to raise that question for the group. Um, um, if anyone has some uh, contributions on that point, I'd love to hear that. Um, thank you, Ella. Can we come to Justin Greening next, former MP and Secretary of State, um, and now Chair of the Social Mobility Pledge? Um, and Justin, we heard from Takumbo the kind of the responsibility on employers to be thinking very proactively about this. We heard from Ella on 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 how much young people are taking the burden of this emotionally as well as practically um as a you know with your policy hat on what you know what can the government be doing to make sure that as we rebuild out of this um social mobility is really at the heart of the agenda well um, there was already an opportunity gap that was completely unacceptable before we had coronavirus um, and it's something I've been working on for a long time and the social mobility pledge is working alongside fantastic charities like Career Ready to try and make sure that there are employers out there who really understand that as Tecumbo said you know this isn't just the right thing to do for young people actually smart companies understand that reaching a wide talent pool that's out there is how they're going to be successful in the future and in fact Brian can talk um, from a BP perspective and some of the work we're doing is with BP but this this time now I think is a real challenge my challenge to policymakers would be if we're not going to look at fixing equality of opportunity now when would we hmm. because it's now an urgent issue and I think you really need quite fundamental reform across the system both within government I think within politics I think through our economy and the role that business plays in spreading opportunity and the pledge is all about saying to companies they can have a much more strategic impact on leveling the playing field if they are prepared to think about the opportunities they have more carefully and where they target them and who they're bringing on board so I, I, I've always recognised the problem, but I, my attitude now is never waste a, a crisis. And I think we should all be saying that now is the moment to fundamentally refashion how we look at opportunity, how we can make sure it's spread more fairly, because I think it's absolutely crucial. And this uh, coronavirus crisis really will cascade through the age group. So it's not just young people. Uh, coming into the jobs market it starts right at those kids who've been out of school for the last several weeks we know the difference in um, home learning environments we've got we might end up with young children in the north coming back later to their schools and missing even more time than say kids in london do um, we know that using predicted grades to then allocate university places 
disproportionately disadvantages young people from less affluent backgrounds whose grades are the most likely to be um, underpredicted. Um, we know that when part-time work dries up, that's the thing that a lot of uh, disadvantaged kids will be relying on to help pay them through university. And so it'd be another reason why maybe that's not something they feel they can afford to do. Um, and then, you know, looking at the sectors that have been really affected the most, which are retail, hospitality and sports and leisure. If you're under 25 in this country and you're in work, one in three under 25 year olds are in those sectors. So this will impact uh, the young generation much, much more, particularly as we almost move from it being a health crisis to this economic crisis. So the government response needs to be looking right the way through that age range to say, well, what can we do to get a kids back into school, obviously, when it's safe, but how are we going to make them catch up? Um, what can we do uh, to, to close those gaps that are already there? For young people going into apprenticeships and, and university, what can we make do to make sure that it's not those that were the probably least likely to be going in the first place that then drop out of the system? Um, for the ones coming into the jobs uh, workplace um, and, the, and the career market, as it were, the work that we're doing on the pledge is really asking companies to literally have opportunity action plans in place. What is their strategy for protecting opportunity and for the opportunities they've got? There may not there may be fewer of them, admittedly, but for the ones they still have, how can they really make sure they're pointing them towards young people who will be the ones most likely to be affected by this crisis. Um, I personally, I recognize all of the challenges, but for me, I just think if we're not prepared to ask ourselves some fundamental questions about what it's going to take to drive equality of opportunity, um, if we don't ask ourselves those questions now, then you know we've really missed, if you like, one of the only good things that can come out of this crisis, which is to start reshaping things more fundamentally. and. You know, I just listened to, um, I think it was Ella, you know, I just think it's, I've always felt it shocking that anybody feels that their path forward is bounded by where they start. And it's a hidden problem. Social mobility in a way is a hidden problem. And that's why we maybe don't see it as clearly, but we absolutely have to, to sort this out. Anyway, my final points mm -hmm. are, um, in sorting it out, we sort so many other things out in Britain. So we start to probably end up with a politics that's more representative and less exclusive. We end up with an economy that has everybody able to contribute to it and will almost certainly be far more productive mm. and we'll be able to stop having to do transfers from some bits of our society that are able to have opportunities to the other bits that have got less of them. So we end up with a more resilient economy and I think society is better because fundamentally feeling like you're in a country where everyone has a fair shot at being successful is almost the common thing that binds us. I think we can celebrate success, but almost only if we feel like we've all had the chance to have a go at getting it. Mm. And so I think on every single level, you know, it's now something we need to look at. And, you know, Britain is going through and has been through a very polarizing period. But the choice we now face on coronavirus is either it can be a turning point that helps us understand we need to come together around one thing we can agree on, which I think should be a quality of opportunity. Or it can be a moment when actually we just supercharge those gaps, mm -hmm. in which case we go down a really bad path. Um, that won't just in my view be bad for you know millions of young people it'll be really bad for as much more widely um, as a UK so I think we just have to rise to the challenge and I think businesses are going to be right at the forefront of that and I think you know my advice would be yes of course we need leadership from Whitehall and from ministers and from government but actually I think businesses can show a huge amount of leadership through this crisis and and the more that leadership can come from outside of parliament in a way um the bigger the 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 push will be for fundamental change mm. i do remember some very very fascinating compelling argument but i do remember um through the last financial crisis um as Tugumbo pointed out um 
you know, that's the template we shouldn't follow. Um, and I do remember during that period, these debates were being had. What do we do differently? What needs to be done differently to get it on the agenda to make sure that that we don't miss the opportunity and go down the other road? Well, you have to reform government and that starts with Treasury. The Treasury fundamentally sees investing in people as a cost and costs are generally minimised. Um, it would look at investing in a road very differently to investing in a person. Mm. And yet we're in a 21st century where it's all going to be about talent. Mm. And so in a sense, an approach that might have worked 30 years ago just doesn't work now. But if that's the approach you're using to work out how you invest taxpayers' money, then you're always going to do another road mm. before you do <laughs> improved schooling. And that's, for me, you know, the argument I was constantly making was, A, we're not looking at the investments consistently and be the time frame you've got to bear in mind um for governments and politics the time frame is too short mm. max you're looking at is five years well for me investing in a young person has a payback of 30 40 50 years but if you're only looking at the first five how are you ever going to see that benefit come through in your numbers so the kinds of reform government needs to do is to plan much longer term so that we can really allow that investment in people to pay back because otherwise you know yeah i'm sure it's really good filling potholes and um you get the benefit from day one but you know strategically that money will really make a difference if it's invested in um getting this generation to stay on track um and i don't think we look at them in the same way and we we should thank you so much for that that's fascinating thank you um uh, can we come to Brian Gilari now from uh, the Chief Finance Officer at BP? Um, I know this is a real kind of personal passion of yours. Um, tell, us, tell us about what your journey has been and, um, and, and your thoughts and reflections on what we've been hearing. I, yeah, no, and actually I'd just start with Justine's last comment, which is um, it would be better that we invest in people to sort out fixing the potholes once and for all, because when they're repaired, they don't seem to last very long. Um, so I start on the basis that any company in business, um, successful business, is typically a function of many things. Companies will describe many things, but it's basically people and technology. It's either some sort of IP or special product that's being created, but it's about the people within that company. And I'll talk a little bit about my background, but the piece for me is any successful company needs to be able to tap into the broad range of diversity of people that is available to it. And that goes beyond gender, gender is important. It goes beyond BAME, that's important. Social mobility and where you come from is just one other aspect of diversity. And look, I was born in a council prefab in Liverpool in a particularly hard area and brought up in our council estate. Uh, had learning difficulties at a very early age of my life. I was, I was classified as a special needs, if that's the word to use these days. It was described somewhat brutally back then in the uh, 60s. Um, and because of the education system, because of teachers that could see potential, I was able to go on and actually, I want to come back to something which Ella said early, the, and just in comments on this, the idea that it's been predetermined where you get to, I do an awful lot with speakers for schools going around meeting underprivileged kids age 11 to 14. And this idea that their future's already been predetermined needs to be completely turned on its head. And what I say to them is, use your disadvantage as an advantage because all companies and I think the social mobility pledge, when Justine, when this came to BP, it was such a um, serendipitous moment because, it, moment because it actually is completely in the grain of what the company is. I was successful at BP and rose to the board of BP because I work within a meritocrat meritocratic company and we base everything on meritocracy. And so the idea that you can tap this incredible pool of talent from these kids from different backgrounds. And I do some work with the University of Manchester. They have a, what they call the second chance saloon um, option, which is it's for kids that 
didn't quite make the grades first time round. They put them through a foundation year. And what you find is those kids go on to be far more successful than the ones that came in with three A's or three A stars or whatever the grade systems are by being given a second chance. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's really important. And one of the things that we do inside BP, there are sort of three areas that we look at. One is around mentoring, one is around internships, and the other one's around apprenticeships. And I've found reintroducing apprentice schemes inside BP, again, you pick kids up in the age of 16 to 18, they're a little bit more hungry, you give them an opportunity, you open them up to a whole world of possibilities, and the company benefits from it. So I, I, for me, this is just such a basic um, requirement of companies that you are tapping into a broad, diverse range of skills. And it goes way beyond, you know, you don't want a company full of the high flying firsts of degrees from every, you know, the top universities in the world. You want a diverse range of people because what you know for sure is all successful companies and you can sort of list them out today have got to where they've got to because they've been able to tap into that diverse resource. And I worry and fear that during COVID-19 that as Justine laid out, there are a number of things that are going to make this even more difficult, which is why I think it's so important because we're going to hit, in my view, a sweet spot with society as um, businesses focus on what their purpose is um, beyond simply returns and making money. That, it goes way beyond that. As we think about what their purpose is, what they give back to society and how they open up opportunities. And, you know, we do it through BP Educational Services, which I've been out and done myself, where you go out to the schools. We, we provide packs, which bizarrely during this, maybe not so bizarrely, during the lockdown, we've seen 20,000 downloads of those educational services. Mm -hmm. They touch 50% of all secondary schools, 25% of all primary schools. And we've seen 1,200 new users a month in the last two months compared to historically about 600. So we know there is a massive desire to be able to tap into that knowledge that you can provide. Uh, but I just think it's good business. And actually the financial, one of the things Justine and I have been talking about, the financial case for this, I think is pretty straightforward. It's not that difficult at all. And it is an investment and it's a 30 to 40 year investment, exactly the way Justine described. Mm. There's some fascinating reflections on this in, in the chat here. And there's one question about, and, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Like, what, is, is it something you'd put targets on? I think, so what we did in the, in the space of diversity, which we're still not good enough, but we, we certainly, um, you know, our, if you look at the board of BP, it's 50% women, 50% men. Um, I think what you need to do is not so much targets as goals. When you set targets, people will attempt to achieve those targets and it may not turn out with the best outcome. If you set clear goals and, you know, a goal could be we want to see 10 percent of our workforce come from this demographic slice. Mm. And I think the organization will work towards it. I think when you set a target in place, inevitably in a very large organization, they'll attempt to short circuit that target especially if you link reward to it and you may end up with the wrong outcome. So I think goals are important. I think targets can become more cumbersome and difficult to, um, to use. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to you in a bit, Brian, but I wanted to bring in some of the people um, in the chat who, um, who are um, directly affected right now. So we've got Sarah Harvey, who is 17 um, and was it, Oh, no, I'm not so. <laughs> that's that's a strange glitch in the system. Um, um, I, I, if if we come to Olivia, who's just been talking about graduating in this circumstance, um, and um, and Sam and Merope, could you go back through the chat and find the person I was talking about because they were making some really good um, reflections. So if we come to Olivia now. Um, is Olivia there? Hi. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Have you got your camera on? I don't have my camera. It's um, not working at the moment. All right. Well, it's lovely to hear from you. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about your situation at the moment, how you're affected by this and, and your reflections on the conversation? Yeah. So like many people, um, so I, uh, st I was the first year of students to um, do the, have the £9,000 uni fees. Mm -hmm. Having gone from um, 
uh, estates Queen Croydon and then we um, I was the first year so when I left graduated from university um, there was Brexit so I'd done a placement year um, and the offer was um, taken back um, and then I was lucky enough to then get on the graduate scheme and another graduate scheme mm -hmm. now three years later when the graduate scheme's finishing it's now COVID um, and so there are a few options being put on the table but um, one of the options which is potentially quite likely is that we get placed in roles which are um, less senior than what Grad, recent graduates have gone into. Mm. I just think what's one of the statements that was said earlier was is this going to continue impacting people um, in the future and I know that these are probably extreme circumstances but so far we are seeing that those changes are impacting the long term and I can see that people who probably um, didn't take to an intestinal placement year and didn't leave when it was Brexit and things won't have necessarily had the impact on their career and their career trajectory because it means that now when I'm going to be going for jobs in the future I will forever be that little bit further behind than I'd perhaps like to be mm. and what I'm capable of doing so it's quite so now it's just about thinking well how can we go around that and continue on that trajectory that we want to and make up that time. So what you're seeing is a very um, sharp impact right now that's actually setting you back in, in your future. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really sorry to, to hear that. Is it, what, what, um, what, what, what can you, what, what, reflecting on the conversation we've had so far, who are you looking to to try and solve some of these things do you think it's something that needs government intervention or do we need to bring in um uh, or is it down to businesses to fix this i think um so i think there's a few things so the reality is if i was from a wealthy background and had lots of contacts and i'm sure that i would be able to get a very good job um and everything would be delightful but <laughs> Um, that's not the situation. So I think, to be honest, what I'm doing is I'm literally just looking for various jobs and trying to work with um, our company's HR department to find a way um, to make sure that we do get the right opportunities and the right approach going forward is taken. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to come to Christy Robertson next, who's been active in the chat. And to apologize to Sarah Harvey, I read your message wrong. I thought you were your 17 year old daughter, but you, um, <laughs> but you were making a very good point about the different provision between state and, and private sectors. Um, but yeah. let, let's come to Christy Robertson next. Thank you, Sarah. Christy, hi, hi. Hi. Do you want to tell us about your situation and, and what you think about, about this conversation? Yeah, so I have just finished my first year of university um, at Harry Watt in Edinburgh. So I'm Scottish, I'm dealing with SAS loans and bursaries and stuff. My sister has just finished her fifth year. Yesterday would have been her higher chemistry exam. Mm. Um, and basically, like, so I, I have like a tortoise media subscription through into university which i was involved with like an internship program last year which paid for my year of university which i don't know whether how accommodation would have been paid for without that program and i know that program is being held online this year um mm -hmm. in june when that pro the membership runs out i'll start my sutton trust membership because i was also involved with sutton trust and um, mm -hmm. whose programs aren't like on whose programs are going to be online this year um, my cousin was involved with the career ready program she's two years older than I am her placement paid for her travel to college so I'm just sort of worried about how you know I look at like all the kids that went to my school I look at my sister and I'm worried about how they're going to be able to afford, like funding is such a barrier like I wasn't if I didn't get my rent back from the uni this year I don't know how I would have been able to commute to uni because I can't drive Mm. for next year and I think there's such a big issue right now about the funding for young people and also like one of my friends is at college and he's just dropped out because they have he's one of three his parents are both key workers so he's 
like doing the homeschooling for his two younger siblings and he's also got to they were all using the one family computer for all of their online learning and stuff and teaching mm -hmm. so he's not been able to do that so he's had to drop it to college like two weeks before the submission date for all mm -hmm. of his work and stuff it's really painful impacts for people on a very personal level isn't it that mm -hmm. kind of real chopping and changing and um as as some of our participants have been pointing out in the chat a lot of people caught up in this might have also experienced some of the effect of 10 years ago so it's kind of it could be kind of cumulative for some people as well mm. i think is it is it jacob or um, i'm not sure if it's jacob or william neil bacon who hi there hello jacob jacob hello um do you want to tell us about your experience I think you were talking about um, the impact of private schools um, in the chat. Do you, do you want to share that thought with, with the group? Oh, we better just unmute you. Are you muted? It might be a classic Zoom fail. So, um, okay, let's let's move on and come back to um come back to ella um ella tell me about the choice you made between apprentices and university because there's got a bit of chat within the in on the chat about why people tend to look to universities rather than apprenticeships for the answers and when apprenticeships are so um you know people like the idea of them but they don't seem to be held in the same esteem in society i think a lot of it comes down to i think just that they're quite new in terms of it's been very recent that they've sort of opened up to wider industries um i remember facing quite a big stigma that apprenticeships were sort of for things like hairdressing or for you know jobs that weren't that you didn't necessarily previously require a degree for um it's really hard to see i think as a student it's really hard to see a lot of people sort of tell you that you won't succeed without a degree mm. um, and that degrees sort of are the way forward. I think it's more sort of a change that we need to see in society, the idea that you can still excel. But unfortunately, I think it's just a matter of time. I think it almost needs to be proven that people who started it in a friendship can make their way up. Um, I guess it's sort of the people that you see in quite big leaderships or in that sort of executive team and companies at the moment still all have a very similar background of a great education followed by a university degree at a very good university um, and so on and so forth. I think it's important that we start to see, I guess people from a different background um, or who chose a different route sort of make their way up that ladder and climb to the top. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I can see Josiah Senu has his hand, little blue digital hand up. Should we come to Josiah? And Josiah, is it right? Are you on the Alumni Leadership Board of the Sutton Trust? Am I right in, in, in that wild guess? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, tell, tell us what, what's, what's your story and, and, and what, what's your thought about how we're going to ensure that social mobility isn't lost in this crisis for sure so um i was actually 10 years old in 2008 so i'm kind of that kid now 12 years on who's 22 years old and seeing everything that's kind of before before me and going on living through brexit covid19 and whatnot and the impacts on young people is very very significant um i i spent the last two years now on the alumni leadership board going to schools across the country of universities across the country and speaking to young people and one of the big issues that they're facing is that you know this issue of predetermination this issue of feeling like they're not able to to meet the same kind of levels and standards as their counterparts and i think a big issue is that we're having a conversation about equality of opportunity which is right and good but what about the issue of fairness because it's one thing to say that we should level the playing field and give everyone the same the same chances but are we giving people the chances that they deserve and as we're seeing from the conversation that we're, we're experiencing the people are facing kind of different circumstances, different issues um, that kind of make it difficult for them to, to, to get into the job market. 
Um, so what are we doing to, to ensure that their issues, their particular plights are being faced with? And I think there needs to be much more of a discussion, at least at a policy level and even at a business level, as to ways in which we can ensure that different demographics are getting the support that they adequately need. So I think it's not just about levelling the playing field, it's about doing something more critical for each circumstance, however difficult that might be because that's the situation that we face if we don't do these things then you know we, we face issues of COVID-19 we face issues with Brexit we face issues of austerity these things are having a huge huge impact on young people tease that apart for me a little bit because I'm a bit like I, I'm not quite sure I quite follow the 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 what sounds like a really important distinction between equality and fairness for sure. So equality of opportunity might be to say that we should treat kind of everyone the same, right? So the, I, this idea that everyone gets an equal shot, trying to help people, especially those who come from less affluent, disadvantaged backgrounds, lifting them up to the position where they have the same chances as everyone else. But should we not be talking about fairness, which is rather treating those people who come from less affluent, disadvantaged backgrounds within their own circumstances? So the things that they deserve, what, what help do they particularly need to ensure that they're able to adequately go hit, hit, meet the same hurdles and issues and challenges that their counterparts face? And there is a difference in doing that because issues like social capital for example the social capital of someone who comes from a private school background is just not going to be the same who comes from a grammar school or a state school they're, they're vastly different even if you provide them resources to get them to the same level where on paper they look the same when they walk into a job interview or where they're searching for a job they still face the same hurdles nothing has been done really to help them at that point be able to have the same the same opportunities or, or rather even the same impact that um, their counterparts will have. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Really fascinating. Thank you for, for explaining that. Um, totally get it. Um, Mandu Reed um, has her blue hand up. Can we come to Mandu, who's, who's a old friend of Tortoise? <laughs> Hi, Hi How are you? Um, I just want to make the point, um, I want to make two points. The first thing I want to say is that um, I agree with Justine on the point she made about investing in people versus hard infrastructure, roads or whatever. 60 years ago, our co economy may well have worked in a way whereby investing in that hard infrastructure would have been the way to kind of create stimulus and growth and prosperity for more people. But that is not the world we live in in the 21st century. I do disagree, though, with um, the final point Justine made, which was that um, there's uh, that the onus perhaps should be on businesses themselves to um, lead this charge. And I think that I can see why she may have said that, but um, I think that these conversations always miss out um, the reality of the situation, which is that SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises, they account for about 99% right, of um, UK businesses. They employ three fifths of people who are employed in the private sector. That's 16.6 .6 million people. And they don't have the capacity in the same way as a, a BP who we, or, or a big corporation like that has to kind of play its part. And so I would argue that where we are in the, in, in the 21st century, given the crisis and the scale of the crisis, we really need government to be leading the way. We need them to incentivize and support the um, you know, small and medium sized enterprises because they will not have the capacity on their own to do what's required. The arguments do need to be made that investing um, in, in people isn't a cost. The cost comes when you don't invest in people and they can't get jobs and then, they, then you have to pay them welfare. And the other, the other point as well where the government does have a kind of disproportionate influence that it isn't you know, maximizing and hasn't for many years is the public sector. And I would obviously zoom in on that because as things stand, it shouldn't be like this, but as things stand, women are disproportionately employed in public sector employment. And so there's a role there, I think. I think this does actually, the, 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 the burden of responsibility is very heavily on our government. And they promise that they're gonna do whatever it takes. And for me, in this context, doing whatever it takes means incentivizing and supporting the section of our economy that could make the biggest difference to all the things we've been talking about. All the mm. young people, 
whom are kind of potentially going to languish now. Their, their talent, their potential, potentially won't kind of um, be maximized and optimized, which does a disservice to all of us. Mandy, I should I should have introduced you properly. Um, Mandy Reid is um, leader of the Women's Equality Party, um, so knows a lot about kind of the political aspects about how you get these things on the agenda. And that's the thing: if if unlike Justine, you think this is something for government to answer, how do we ensure? Um, what does a campaign look like to ensure that that government does? treat this seriously in the COVID-19 response? I mean, again, I have to anchor back to, can you hear me? Did I unmute myself? I no. did. I successfully unmuted myself. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the answer to this is anchored again in something Justine said, which is the problem we've got is political cycles are too short to uh, create um, enough of an incentive for this real long-term thinking to happen. And so um, we're kind of in a situation where to force the agenda, uh, people need to organize and galvanize and expe express, this is, I'm talking to a lot of the young people here, I guess, express their displeasure. Um, and that may well be um, striking if necessary, that may well be, um, you know, finding other means to demonstrate that at the ballot box, not addressing these issues is going to result in any party, I don't care who they are, it could be our current opposition, it could be the, the party that's currently in government, they need, it needs to be made politically expedient. And that the only way to do that in the system we have is for people to organize on the ground. And a call like this is great, but there's only 100 people on it. We need 50,000 people to be having this conversation and then going away from this conversation to bring more people in to apply, apply the pressure that needs to be applied. And the window's quite small. It really is. I say with all this COVID stuff, we're still in the prologue stage of the crisis. So right now, all the young people on this call, anybody else who cares about their plight needs to be asking themselves, what do we want the epilogue to be? And recognize we've got a very small window of opportunity to apply the pressure that will make the difference and change the extent to which these issues are treated as uh, you know, election winning or election losing issues. Thank you so much. I just, just so we don't lose that thread, I want to come back to Justine very briefly to respond on that point, business versus um, government or partnerships, and then to come straight to Daniel Dippo, who's had his hand up for a while after that, and we're, we're tight on time. It's, it's what I'm saying is it's for everyone. One of the reasons we don't fix social mobility is we almost expect government to do it, and clearly that hasn't happened for decades. And I can tell you, if Parliament could just have passed a law and sorted this out, it would have done. If we could just have spent our way to fixing this problem, we would have done. If the issue is more complex than that, and it needs more actors in our society to change for it to actually be uh, successful. So that's why we're working with businesses, because that's a key part of this. You know, we focus on all the investment on education. We spend about 40 odd billion pounds on primary, secondary every year and then have no real sense about how that talent's used. Mm. So what I'm saying is that if you're going to have a full strategy on social mobility, yes, you need a strategy for education, but you also need a strategy for how you then use that talent. And I'm saying that actually we need a society to have this kind of debate about what our attitudes to opportunity and the point that was made earlier about what fair looks like. Mm. And I think we need to recognize that one of the reasons this never gets fixed is because you don't miss what you've never had. Mm. And it may be easier now for young people to see almost what they're missing out on than it used to be. And I think that's possibly why we're having a, a better debate on it. But actually, I wonder whether part of the challenge is there hasn't, you know, I've always questioned why aren't people out protesting about this? It's pretty outrageous mm. that you get held back by the randomness of where you start. But I think the reason is because people just don't realize what the different and better paths that maybe other people get to are. And so we need to have a complete sea change of our opportunities um, discussion. And finally, my final important point is 
we need to realize it's not a zero sum game. So when I ever talk about social mobility, someone always says, ah, yes, but if someone's going to do better, who's going to do worse? Mm. I completely disagree with that analysis. More people getting more opportunities is how we create more opportunities. It is a, it, it floats everyone's boat. And, you know, as soon as we realize that the worst thing we can do is waste the talent, then I think we get into a much more productive discussion. And actually one final, final point, politicians need to start talking about solutions. Mm. If all we ever do is argue about the problems, what was there before and why didn't we, it, we now have to say, what can we collectively agree on that will change this? Don't lose sight of the debate where we disagree. That is fine and it's important. But let's at least coalesce around some of the solutions and make some progress on them because that's how you get the long-term change that can stick instead of the chopping and changing that happens every five years, which is, I think, one of the big problems for tackling this generational issue. Thank you so much for that. I'd, I'd love to come to Daniel Dipper very quickly. I can see Naomi and Nick Headley also have their hands up. I think we're not going to have time, so I'd really encourage you to leave your comments in the chat because that way it still feeds into our editorial process. I can see Jacob, who we couldn't hear from earlier, has left his comment in the chat and that's really brilliant. Thank you, Jacob. Um, but Daniel, what was the point you wanted to make? Yeah, um, so the point that I raised was actually about um, there's some new challenges that have been raised by the, the COVID crisis as such. So a particular one that I'm quite concerned about as an A-level student is the fact that the examination process, of course, has had to change as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the standardization measures that Ofqual have said they want to use is comparing your grades to your average for the school over the last three years. And that's a particular concern to me because my school's quite disadvantaged and I've always kind of excelled above uh, kind of the grades my school have got. But actually in this case, they're going to compare my grades to the average and chances are mine will be much higher than the average. And they've actually said that some grades will be adjusted downwards as a result of that. So that's a particular concern, I think, for social mobility, because it's always been it's not about where you come from or your school. It should be about this equality of opportunity or, or fairness, which we've been discussing today. But actually, that kind of just reinforces this idea it is where you come from, because a school that gets 50 A stars every year, well, they can have those 50 A stars. But a school like mine, which doesn't get A stars that often, well, chances are I won't be able to get that because of the average. I mean, that is like one of those things that crystallizes an idea so sharply. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I'm sorry to hear that. It's, um, it's all these micro effects that have huge impacts on individuals' lives. I want to come back to Brian Gavari from VP very briefly before we start to wrap up brian are you there just for your yeah, look and I, I think it's been there have been some really interesting points here and I, I i i feel this is something i hold close to heart because when you come from the backgrounds that some of these people are talking about that was my life and my life was not predetermined um and i didn't go to a particularly good school and i didn't get particularly great grades but i did manage to sort of find a way through i would say some of the best talent inside bp never went to university do not assume all answers lead to universities. That's why we are spending so much time now on apprentice schemes. Coming back to Mandu's point, I, I sort of semi-agree with you that the place this starts is education, but that's going to take a decade to fix. We take engineers now out of universities. It takes us two years to retrain them so that they can actually perform the sort of roles that they would have been performing 30 years ago. So I think there is a role for government but it's a long-term role over decades and it ain't gonna fix this problem in the short term. So therefore, I think Justine's right, the pressure has to be on business and you're right, it's SMEs in the broadest sense. We have to come up with plans that help that make sure that we open up our, our companies to these meritocracies that says, actually, it doesn't matter where you come from, but actually we're gonna maybe have a little bit more pressure on us that we have to demonstrate through the plans that we're putting in place, the social mobility pledge, that actually we are moving the dial in this space and creating opportunities. And I want to come back to Ella's very first point where she talked about uh, her words were, it's the time is not to give up. Actually, I think with everything we've heard on this call with CV COVID-19, this is now the time to accelerate. It's actually to push forward at an even harder pace and hold companies to account. Um, and the one thing I would leave, in, and it's the thing I do when I go around schools and I spend a lot of time with underprivileged kids in very tough places and same places I was brought up where um, actually my family still live. I'm the only one to have left Liverpool. Um, 
their future has not pre been predetermined. The only thing that will get in the way of their future and their aspirations is themselves and the limits they put on themselves. And the more we can show and open up opportunities to them to show what they can really do and allow them all to get to their potential, uh, then actually I think then that does lead to a more meritocratic society. But I think there's a lot of issues here to be resolved. I don't think government's going to fix it for us. Thank you so much for that. Just briefly, I'm going to wrap up um, what has been a fascinating conversation um, and, and still, you know, quite shocking. Ella's point about that predetermination that so many of you reflected on, the feeling that where you come from does dictate um, where you can go in life and how this situation is affecting that. Um, is a theme that runs through this whole conversation. But what really struck me um, was the sense of urgency that the moment is now to tackle this. Um, what Takumbo said about um, the last recession being the template not to follow, we must learn from that. Um, Justine's point about if not now, when, and looking at how inequality could be stitched through at every age group and every part of the impact of this crisis. And I think um, this, this issue about who's responsible, is it us as individuals, is it government, is it business, is it all? It probably is all, but how do we, how do we get this on the agenda in a very urgent way now? Um, is the thing that I will take away and back into our editorial conversations and really think about how we can report this story out from all the voices of young people we've heard today to the very important policy um, debate we've had as well. Um, and the other thing that just really struck me, Takumbo said in, in the conversation we had before about how this isn't just about um, diversity, it's about inclusion, it's how people feel once they get to a, a, a company. And um, that really struck with Josiah's point as well about um, equality versus fairness and how even as we try and get a very, this incredibly important issue on the agenda in a, in a time when we've got very little headspace to do it in the right way, um, lots for us to think about and consider in our journalism going forward which we will commit to do and um, i want to thank you all for taking part to our speakers to bp for supporting us to have this conversation um, thank you all very much at end of thinking we like to wave because we never quite know how to finish so thank you very much and hope to see you at another thinking again soon bye